1970 was a peculiar year in Hollywood history. The original movie moguls were fading from the scene, being replaced by men from Wall Street. At Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, it wasn't just a corporate takeover, it was a raid. That year, the entire studio was sold to a reclusive financier named Kirk Kerkorian. He immediately cashed out, selling studio property to finance a new casino in Las Vegas. The wholesale liquidation was highlighted by a lucrative land sale, which included MGM's storied back lots, studio lots two, three, four, and five. The land was worth a fortune, but the contents of the land, the physical property stored on the back lots, was seriously undervalued. This was MGM's closet. To Louis B. Mayer, it was the world's largest movie-making warehouse, a veritable treasure chest of antiques, artwork, machinery, and costumes. But to Wall Street, it was nothing but a burden of storage and maintenance. It was junk. Kerkorian could have kept some of the historic memorabilia to display in his casino, but instead, he sold everything to an auctioneer named David Weiss for a mere $1.5 million. A single pair of ruby slippers is worth that today. David Weiss bought an unbelievable assortment of Hollywood treasures, from Ben-Hur's chariots and the HMS Bounty to Clark Gable's coats and Greta Garbo's gowns. There were cars, trains, airplanes, tanks, and the full-sized paddle wheeler from Showboat. Costumes alone filled seven buildings, over 350,000 separate items. The auctioneer was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of material, but he recognized the celebrity value connected to some of the items. So he decided to hold a glamorous, well-publicized star auction. Afterwards, he presided over the largest and saddest garage sale Hollywood has ever known. He was so sad and it was so ridiculous and so narrow-minded and just stupid is the word. And I've never forgotten it, and I've never gotten over it, and, and I'm even still angry about it. The MGM auction of May 1970 was like an 18-day wake for Hollywood. I sobbed every day uncontrollably. I was like this having a breakdown person. People just would look and go, well, what is the matter with her? The auction officially began on May 1st and culminated with the Star Wardrobe sale on May 17th. It was a magnificent production in itself. Debbie Reynolds was there for every minute of it, checkbook in hand. Her goal was to preserve as much of Hollywood's history as she could before the studio threw it all away. I was every day at auction for three to four weeks, as long as it went. I wasn't into buying the rose bushes and uh, all of the, the uh, lamp posts and I couldn't really buy the airplanes I did buy cars and I did buy sets which means the furniture from a picture and the costume so I could recreate a famous scene from every famous motion picture that had won an Academy Award from MGM Reynolds spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to save countless Hollywood treasures but strangely she didn't bid a dime for the ruby slippers in truth, nobody expected much action from the frumpy pair of sequined shoes. But when the gavel came down at $15,000, they became the most valuable memorabilia in Hollywood history. Imagine the surprise of Roberta Bauman, a Memphis housewife, on Monday morning, May 18, 1970. There she was, reading the newspaper in her kitchen, when a story from Culver City, California, caught her eye. I said, looky here. One pair of shoes brought $15,000 out in uh, Culver City. The story said the shoes had been auctioned by MGM the day before. Roberta was surprised because she had the ruby slippers in her closet and thought they were the only pair. Within hours, Roberta's story and photograph hit the newswires. There she was, holding her pair of ruby slippers. 
Suddenly, the press had a mystery to solve. Roberta said she had won them in a movie contest, and she had proof to back it up. In high school, she had belonged to a club, the Photo Play Club, that watched and reviewed movies. The year was 1939, Hollywood's epic year. Roberta was a junior. That winter, members of the photo play club entered a contest. Metro Goldwyn Mayor had a promotion, and we were told to send a postcard to New York to vote on the 10 best pictures of 1939. Roberta voted Gone with the Wind, number one. She can't recall where she placed the Wizard of Oz. Her picks were good enough to win second place in the contest. And her prize? The ruby red slippers. The size 6B shoes were presented to her in the spring of 1940. She was 16 years old, Dorothy's age. For 30 years, Roberta believed she had the only pair of ruby slippers. I had no idea, and I didn't at that time know how many pairs were out there. Between 1940 and 1970, Roberta enjoyed sharing her pair of magic shoes with the public. But news of the MGM auction changed everything. For Roberta, it was the first of many gigantic twists along her own yellow brick road. At first, she thought one of the pairs had to be fakes, and she worried that the fakes might be hers. Fearing the worst, she called her old high school teacher, Miss Josephine Allensworth. I said, you know, Miss Josephine, we weren't told uh, anything about these shoes, and I don't know how many pairs are they, and what should I do? She said, challenge them. She said, go up to the newspaper and and tell, tell about it, how you received them in high school. And that's what I did. But the press found no answers. So she decided to contact MGM directly. I wrote a letter to Metro Golden Mayor in Culver City to ask them to confirm if I had an authentic pair of ruby slippers. Because I had told the little children in all the schools all the time I had them that I was told when I received them, when my teacher received them, they had been worn by Judy Garland. MGM refused Roberta's letter, marking the envelope returned to sender. But the studio could not ignore the controversy, so they referred it to David Weiss. The auctioneer was just as surprised as Mrs. Bauman. In a letter to the anonymous buyer, Weiss said, there was only one pair of garland red shoes in the MGM inventory, but that was not the whole truth. Soon, what was common knowledge among Hollywood costumers became obvious to Roberta Bauman, David Weiss, and not insignificantly, the man who paid $15,000 at the MGM auction for what he thought were the only ruby slippers. After the sale, Debbie Reynolds quietly told people she didn't bid on the shoes because she believed they belonged to Judy Garland's stand-in. I tried them on, and I would have bid, but I knew they weren't the real pair, so why would I bid? What Reynolds didn't say was that she knew there were other pairs of ruby slippers, and she knew who had them. His name was Kent Warner, and he alone held the secret of the missing ruby slippers. After the MGM auction and Roberta Bauman's revelation, the mystery of the ruby slippers began to grow. People began to wonder how many pairs actually existed. Only one man ever knew. His name was Kent Warner. He was a Hollywood costumer who was very bright and talented with a keen understanding of movie history. Like Debbie Reynolds, Kent Warner witnessed the wholesale trashing of Hollywood's most important costumes and props during the 1960s and 70s. He watched the big studios throw everything away, and he did something about it. His friends called him Lana Lift, but he became better known as Hollywood's Robin Hood. 
Because of his clandestine actions, many Hollywood treasures were saved from destruction. Kent Warner came to Hollywood when he was 21 years old. He was a native of New York who loved movies and wanted to work in show business. His first job was with a Hollywood rental company that specialized in movie wardrobe. It was 1964. That summer, the rental house bought the RKO wardrobe collection. RKO, once home to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, had been thoroughly trashed by various owners since the 1950s. By 64, its physical assets were in disarray. Warner was sent to RKO by his boss to see what was there. He was shocked. Some costumes were being used as kitchen rags. Others were rotting on their hangers. Beautiful garments, once worn by Hollywood's greatest stars, were falling apart. The rental house was only interested in wearable items. Throw away the rest, Warner was told. The tragic scene made Kent wonder, how could so much history, so many beautiful things, be treated so badly? Very quickly, he sized up the situation. The studios, all of them, were systematically trashing important Hollywood artifacts. He saw it being trashed. I saw it being trashed. I would drive every night off the lot, and they were burning film clips over in trash cans. They threw all the original music, all the scores, over the, when they were building the freeway. It's buried under the freeway. Kent Warner agonized about this. Things had to be saved, rescued, liberated. So instead of throwing away Ginger Rogers' famous gowns, he kept them for himself. But Kent Warner took his work one step further. Some clothes, like top hats, were reusable. But Warner didn't turn in the ones marked with the name Fred Astaire. And nobody missed them. Kent Warner understood the value of historic costumes. They were treasures worth good money. One thing led to another, and soon Kent Warner was quietly selling wardrobe out of the trunk of his car. It was risky, but lucrative and rewarding. Almost single-handedly, he created a thriving underground marketplace for historic Hollywood memorabilia. Between 1964 and 1972, Kent Warner worked this Robin Hood act at all the major studios. Because he was a costumer by trade, he regularly went to all the studio wardrobe departments and rental houses in town. He got to know all the people, even the gate guards. He could drive his car anywhere on any lot and carry off an armful, or rack, of costumes. He had carte blanche. He also had a connoisseur's eye. Warner recognized the important pieces and went for them. He sought out clothes worn by Rudolph Valentino, Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable, Greta Garbo, and not just run-of-the-mill items, but key pieces, like Bogart's trench coats from Casablanca. He went for the best. Certain costumes had personal value to him, especially those worn by Judy Garland. Kent Warner idolized Judy Garland. In 1965, he attended the Academy Awards, and during the dinner, he mugged behind the Hollywood siren. More than anything, Kent Warner hoped that one day he might be able to find and rescue Judy Garland's ruby slippers the day came in 1970 when Kent Warner hired on at MGM to help prepare the costume inventory for auction and liquidation. He worked there. He worked for free. They gave him costumes instead of money. They paid him a little bit of money and they let him pick what he wanted. He was just smart enough to work there. I would have worked there for free. 